This week on Wealth Track, how to invest in an upside down world. With negative interest rates, investors have to pay governments to lend them money. With Brexit, the UK has exited its largest block of trading partners. Veteran global mutual fund manager Philippe Rougier Trelat and top strategist Jason Trenert share their strategies. Next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management Global Perspective, Rosalind P. Walter, and the Fairholm Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Turmoil, volatility, and uncertainty have long been considered enemies of stock markets. They certainly proved that once again in the days immediately following Brexit, when British voters passed a referendum to exit the European Union. For a few trading sessions, investors fled stocks and other assets perceived to be risky and flocked to traditional safe havens such as gold and long maturity U.S. Treasury bonds, as well as debt of other countries considered to be of high credit quality, including Germany, France and Japan. According to bond rating firm Fitch, sovereign debt with below zero yields increased by $1.3 trillion in the month of June to a total of $11.7 trillion, boosted by the Brexit vote. Longer maturity debt was particularly popular. According to bond rating firm Fitch, sovereign debt with below zero yields increased by $1.3 trillion in the month of June to a total of $11.7 trillion, boosted by the Brexit vote. Longer maturity debt was particularly popular. Japan's negative yielding debt grew about 18% to 7.9 trillion, France's by 13% and Germany's by 8% to over a trillion dollars each. Britain is the first country to exit the now 28 country European Union, which took its current form in 1992 as a single market, allowing goods, services, money and people to move freely among member states as if it were a single country. It has its own parliament located in Brussels with the ability to regulate a wide range of areas, including the environment, transportation, consumer rights, employment rules, and even such things as mobile phone charges and electric tea kettles. Its single currency, the euro, wasn't created until 1999, and the UK opted to keep its own currency, the pound sterling, as of several other member countries, including Denmark and Sweden. Why did the Brexit vote set off such a firestorm in global markets? How much of a threat is it still to the global economy and financial markets? Well, joining us are two market pros who have been tracking these developments closely. Philippe Brugere Trelat, Executive Vice President of Franklin Mutual Series, is a contrarian value investor with years of experience investing in Europe and other international markets. He is co-portfolio manager of three funds since 2004 of the four-star rated Franklin Mutual European Fund, since 2009 of four-star rated Franklin Mutual Global Discovery Fund, and also since 2009 of the four-star Franklin Mutual International Fund. Jason Trenert is co-founder, managing partner, and chief investment strategist at Strategus Research Partners, an independent investment strategy and macroeconomic firm celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. Identified by Barron's as one of Wall Street's best minds, Trenert and his team are known for their original and timely economic, political, and market analysis and identification of investment themes. The firm recently started Strategus Asset Management to enable clients to invest in portfolios based on three of those themes. One on policy opportunities, another on large cap dividend growth, and another on their Thrifty 50 portfolio, which they now call their new sovereigns. And that is the one I will ask Trenard about. I started the interview with Brexit. How much long-term damage could it cause? So short term, it's difficult to say with, uh, with precision, but there's no doubt that Britain out of the uh, EU is going to see a very negative impact on its GDP growth. 
this is absolutely um, uh, uh, expected. And so I, so, so I expect those who it. are saying that it actually could be a positive, that in fact it could turn out to be you know, a haven, it could become very entrepreneurial, uh, it could benefit from lack of EU regulation, whatever you're saying, well, basically not know, a chance. To start with, the UK was pretty uh, lightly regulated compared with other European markets because they had negotiated deals which were very favorable. Mm -hmm. So that, that's not a big, it's not going to be a big difference. And if you look at uh, the economic ties between the UK and the EU, the UK needs the EU much more than the EU needs the UK, because about 13% of UK GDP are exports to the EU. The other way around, it's 3%. So um, uh, being out of the single market matters a lot more. So it all depends what kind of deal they're going to negotiate. Right. And it's going to be a long-term process to, to figure this out. out. W what about that this is the first shoe to drop? I mean, if, if you actually look at a, a Pew, a recent Pew poll, uh, it, it showed that the unfavorable uh, ratings towards the EU were actually quite pronounced in countries like France, for instance. You're absolutely and, right. And I think the biggest long-term uh, risk for the EU is not so much economical as I just explained, but it's, it's political. political. Mm -hmm. It's a precedent. It's a precedent and it resonates with a, a, a fairly large number mm -hmm. of people across Europe who are, uh, uh, don't think the EU is a very good idea. Right. And um, so to me, the risk of another country leaving uh, is pretty low. Right, uh, Spain voted against leaving Spain, in, the, in the most Spain recent is against election. Leaving. The riskiest is in France because the, the, the French, uh, the National Front, Front National, has about, according to the polls, about 30% of, 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 of uh, the, elect, the electorate. But what's interesting is that in the latest regional elections, where they typically are more successful than in national elections, they didn't win one more extra seat. Jason, from Strategus's point of view, what is the significance of Brexit? Well, I uh, I tend to agree. It's uh, certainly with Philippe that it, it's very it's and in the next year or two it's going to be very tough, uh, right. certainly on the UK economy. And I I am in some ways much more concerned uh, about the impact on uh, the member states of the European Union themselves. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that the union is really never popular in any country. It was really something that was driven by elites. Mm -hmm for very good reasons, very good uh, motivations, which is essentially to avoid another war. Right. But the problem is that um, I think a lot of the member states uh, are relatively new to being unified themselves. I mean, it Italy, as an example, was only unified in 1861. Um, it's hard enough to get, let's say, Italians to follow what's happening in Rome and accept it, much less Brussels. Right. And I think that the UK is some sort of, is, is really, in my opinion, is the start of a wave. I also think there's some, there's some parallels between what's happening there and obviously what's happening in the United States in terms with, of with nationalism, Trump's with Trump's candidacy. And, and, right, and Bernie I Sanders think, from another point of view. From another right. point of view, and it really has to do with sovereignty and self-determination. and, and there are other, obviously other very emotional issues that are tied to it. Right. At the margin, I think it benefits the United States, though. Um, and not only has the U.S. been a safe haven and has the exorbitant privilege of being, uh, of being the, uh, the reserve currency, mm -hmm. I think even more now, given the, the political drama that is, unlikely, is likely to unfold uh, in Europe, uh, I think the U.S. tends to benefit uh, from that as well, at least as just being a safe haven for right. assets. And are you anticipating th that Brexit, for instance, will affect the global economy in a negative way? You're yes. saying it definitely is going to the U.K. Will the Eurozone, will, will Europe as yes, well? Yes, absolutely. The U.S. US is, is probably more, somewhat more uh, insulated, but not obviously can't be completely insulated from what's what's happening in Europe. And yet, Philippe, you said that really that the that the UK was the biggest loser. That it, it's not going to affect uh, Europe as much. Um, that, it, but but you're saying that, that it's still it's going to have a negative impact. That was a relative statement because right. um, the the uncertainty created by that withdrawal will 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 impact what is already a pretty modest economic growth. Yes. And by the way, the, the what's interesting is that the rise in this anti-EU sentiment really uh, started during the global financial crisis, and it's 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 it's, it's the economic travails of Europe which have given uh, 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 this. Uh, a voice to these anti-EU people. So my sense is that um, if down the road the economy somehow manages to muddle through, um, that's, that's 
it's a nice bet to think that uh, it will not happen. Um, I think one should never underestimate the political angle of the EU. It was built with no rhyme, no reason. Uh, the euro has no, um, I mean, I, it's very easy to destroy the rationale of the euro. But uh, the whole construct was really done to end the wars. And the started the predecessor exactly. organizations being and, right after and World the War II. The fact is that right. since the creation of the EU uh, back in 57, the continent has known a period of peace and relative prosperity, which hadn't been seen, I hope you're seated, since the Roman Empire. From an investment point of view, mm -hmm. how important is this? I mean, how much attention are you paying to this as a contrarian value Ve investment? Very much so. Very because, much so, and uh, why? Because of the volatility, because of the uncertainty, mm -hmm. and um, I think the picture has somewhat changed when it comes to value investing in Europe, because uh, some stocks have become very cheap, but I think they have also become very cheap for good reasons. Mm -hmm. And that is particularly, for instance, uh, uh, um, not all of them, but a large number of European banks. And explain that, because I think at one point in your European fund, you had a yeah. fairly substantial yeah. and that, that, uh, that, that, proportion that, that, that invested in European banks. That has considerably diminished right. now. And I think the prospects facing European banks and UK banks are um, uh, it's not so much a capital issue or solvability issue, it's an earnings issue. Because it's very simple, the earnings are coming from what? From making loans, but loans are part of a GDP growth, and if GDP growth is not there, loans aren't there. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you have the, the European banks burdened with negative interest rates yes. at the European Central Bank, which hurts net interest mounting. So one of the offsets to that negative, which were volume growth, loan growth, has disappeared. Right. And actually, Jason has written a great deal, and your team has, about negative interest rates, and actually, negatively, <laughs> you've written right. about them, negative, um, is negative that the damage rates. that negative interest rates have caused. Yeah. Would you just give us a quick primer on why negative interest rates um, are so detrimental? Well, you know, this is something I think that it has a lot of currency, the idea uh, among, and I'm sorry to keep beating up on the intellectual elites, but the PhDs at the Federal Reserve and the other central banks around the world think that zero is just a number. And, and, and actually, they've said that. They've said that. Yes. Zero is just a number. The right. problem is that average people, ordinary people, really don't want to pay to loan uh, money to the government. Right. Uh, and so I was in Japan in February. The first article I read when I sat down uh, to have my meal uh, was that Japanese people were buying safes and taking money out of the banking system. So the, 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 because they were getting nothing they were getting, in the, the bank. And they, and they were and, afraid and of actually, actually getting a haircut on, right. their, on their savings. Right. So the, the main rationale for negative interest rates is to get people to take more risk and I would say the markets have spoken. Uh, if you look at Japanese bank stocks, if you look at the places where there are negative interest rates, people are taking less risk. And so zero, it turns out, isn't just a number. Philly, regardless of what happens in the, the macro picture, you still have to invest. <laughs> sure. Um, so talk to us about what your uh, you know, current investment strategy is in, 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 the, uh, in the European mutual funds sure. specifically. Well, well, first of all, we, we, we have cash. We have a nice level of cash. And that, that allows me, us, to take advantage of opportunities, not automatically now, but when they're going to present themselves, right. when clarity will, will, will start reappearing uh, on the horizon. I mean, how much cash, when, when you're talking, is it you know, very of, opportunistic? It's, 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 is, it's, it's, is it substantial? It's double, it's double digit. I shouldn't read that as a very defensive, protective. No, no, it's opportunistic. Opportunistic. But you know, the, the question is, is it you know, uh, it's like catching falling knives. Uh, where, 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 where do you start? Yes. And and second, we're extremely diversified. We really we have over in the European Fund, which is more limited in its mandate. Yes. We have well over sixty-five, between sixty-five and seventy positions. So nothing will hurt us badly. Right. And and. Uh, again, we're focused on cash flow, we're focused on balance sheet, um, we're focused on um, low valuations. So all that, the, the, the investment process in itself helps uh, handle the, the market volatility. Now, and, I've, I've heard you know, people, other people talk about th that there are lots of value traps very much so. out there. You're not seeing the kind of opportunities that are going to attract you as a deep value contrarian We're investor. seeing opportunities, but the, the question is the, 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 the macro 
the political environment in Europe is so opaque, mm -hmm. so unclear, mm -hmm. that I think it's, it's, it's risky to, 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 to plunge, you know, to, to jump right. uh, headfirst in the, in the market. Uh, doesn't mean that I haven't been buying a few things around, but uh, not, not in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And really what I, you know what's interesting, and it's a big irony, do you know what, who is the best performing market in Europe year to date? It's the UK market. It's a yeah. FTSE 100. And it's not only the FTSE 100, which is home um, to uh, a lot of global multinationals, that you understand, but it's also the FTSE All Share Index, which is back to a, uh, its high for the year. Now, is this in local currency? In local or, currency. Right, right. In local so this currency. Is in, the in, in sterling. Sure, right, sure, sure. right, sterling. Uh, yeah, you better be hedged then. Yes. Um, but uh, uh, it's as That if is very ironic. It's, it's as if Brexit didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're back, we're back to pre, and above pre-Brexit levels. Now, How do you explain that? Is there any rationale to? I think that markets have realized that uh, the UK is home to a lot of big multinationals who derive 80, 85, 90 percent of their earnings from outside the UK. Yes. And there they go because they will be direct beneficiaries everything else remaining equal of a much quicker pound, because the pound has collapsed, the pound hasn't come back right. up. Uh, from, and if you have huge businesses the UK, in the US, you're going to do well. and if you have huge businesses in the US, like a very large number of companies, uh, like a, a, a Glaxo or a Vodafone, you, 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 you do very well. Plus, if you're an oil company, if you're British Petroleum or Royal Dutch Shell, which are both listed in London, these are dollar, these are dollar, uh, uh, companies. Right. That just happen to be listed on the uh, London Stock Exchange. So these these are these explain why the the FTSE has gone up. Which actually is just a perfect segue to what you're doing at Strategus. Uh, you've now started as officially Strategus Asset Management, yes. and our theme investors have been for a long time. And one of your your themes has been this concept of the new sovereigns. Explain what that is, and it actually kind of fits into what Philippe is talking about, the kinds of companies that, that can do well. The idea is that uh, in a world of negative interest rates, it, it's hard to know what the risk-free asset is. Uh, and so if you're a Japanese investor, there is really no risk-free asset uh, because you're, right. the, you're your local bond costs you money to own it. So, and, and a risk-free asset, just for, for our, our, our audience, uh, it's, it's usually speaking, like it's the 10-year treasury bond. It's a 10-year treasury bond. It's, it's what you get it, yeah. right, if you invest it's, it, and it's, it's you know, risk-free. So right. we're, we're is we've isolated companies that uh, have the lowest insurance premiums in terms of default. Or they're essentially what the market is, is telling us are the safest companies, have the best balance sheets. Uh, in the United States. Right, and you know, these are based on the credit default swap market. Credit and so default the swap market, market and, some, saying, and balance sheet analysis right. that we do. So we've isolated 50 stocks. It's not a particularly, um, it's not particularly complex the way we're doing it, but it also uh, it has been working. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's largely because people are viewing these companies as proxies for sovereign debt. In a world in which you can't get yield from your local, uh, your, your local bond, you might buy a Coca-Cola, or you might buy a Procter & Gamble, or you might buy Exxon, or companies where you're relatively certain that the dividend yield that you're getting is safe. Right, and, and so the market is judging that, that their credit worthiness is, is greater than the credit worthiness of France, of Germany, I mean, even some of them of the U.S. government. Right. We've, uh, we've counted 64 companies in the United States that have lower credit default swap spreads are cheaper to insure than the French, than French sovereign debt. There are 90 companies in the U.S. that have lower insurance premiums or credit default swap spreads than Japanese government mm -hmm. debt. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, again, in places where you have no option uh, to get some risk-free asset, um, the stocks of very, very large companies with fortress-like balance sheets are, seem like better credits. Right. Now, the companies, I have to say, are they're not cheap because of this, right? So they're, they're um, but they continue to, they, they, they seem to be continuing to go up and I, I would suspect they continue to go up until inflation uh, changes or there's a change in central bank policy. Right, and, and the names in, in the, of these 50 stocks will, will change depending on what right. the, every how quarter. the market, every quarter. Right. And, and I'm, these are not buy recommendations, but I'm just saying that in the portfolio are things like household names, as you just mentioned, Coca-Cola, J&J, Lockheed Martin, 3M, Colgate, Palmolive, and AutoZone. I mean, so it's a, it's a pretty broad list, but a very well-known 
it companies is. with it, you know very strong balance sheets and and so so d does this fit in at all to the kinds of companies that you would look at as well? A, if you look at the equivalent in the in, in Europe, the Nestle's and the Norm yes. of the world. When you're a value investor, it's hard to pay 25 times earnings. Right. Because you say to yourself, there's not going to be any multiple expansion, forget that. Uh, so where, where, where are the earnings growth coming from? Right. From top line, yes, good cash flow, but it's largely reflected in the, in, in the valuation at 25 times. So my tack, and they're perfectly good companies, yeah. by the way, we used to own a, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, at some point there I has been, in other words. I think, <laughs> I, I, think, I think at some point we had 1% of Nestle among uh -huh. all our, our friends. But uh, what, what I think is interesting now in Europe are companies which are not trading at 25 times, but trading, say, at uh, 12, 13 times cash flow, for instance, uh, and have very good dividend yield. What's attractive still in Europe is the dividend yield. The average dividend yield on the equivalent of the S&P 500, which has a very funny name, it's called the Stocks 600, is close to 4%. That's an average. So that tells you there are a lot of companies with decent balance sheet, well-covered dividend yielding between 3 and 6%. And there are sectors where you can easily, and it's not the banks, mm -hmm. find mm -hmm. six, seven percent a year, wow. like, like the telecom sector. Right. And I think that despite uh, the, the economic uh, problems, issues arising uh, in Europe, people will still talk, people still will um, exchange data, and, and, and data traffic is still going up exponentially. So um, these companies are going to do well. And a large number of them have finished their capital ex capex program, mm -hmm. so they are about to start generating free cash flow. So I like this kind of mm -hmm. And so dividends are an important in a, in a very slow much so growth now environment. Because dividends absolutely, matter more. Absolutely, and you know what's wrong about six percent dividend yes. in this in this Seriously. day and age when the ten-year German bond is negative. Yes. yes. Dividends in the United States, dividends have been almost fifty percent of the total return. Uh, from the stock market since 1926. Right. So it's not an inconsequential part of the total return from stocks. I think that for, there, there was a period of time when there was a discriminatory tax treatment against dividends versus capital mm -hmm. gains and other periods of time where the growth stocks were all the rage where they got kind of a bad rap. Right. But in a world where you have such low interest rates, dividends are more important than ever. I can't believe that actually this program is almost over. We've almost run out of time because I could continue talking to you two for several more hours. But it is time for the one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio. What would you have all of us own in a long-term diversified portfolio, Philippe? You want one stock? Yes. That's tough because that's putting all your eggs in the same basket. Yes. Uh, okay. I'm happy to talk about Vodafone, for all instance. Right. I think Vodafone is, uh, is, is not going to be impacted to any significant extent by what's happening in the UK. They actually said they were, they were looking at uh, moving the headquarters to um, either Dublin or, Frank or uh, Germany. So it shows how global and, and, and not non-UK they are. And you have a 6.5% dividend, well covered, very well covered. Right. Uh, and uh, you know a fortress balance sheet. And it's a global company. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I'm going to give you an ETF, actually. Right. So uh, <laughs> power shares, uh, aerospace and defense, the PPA, uh, because I do think uh, some of the fracturing uh, of the kind of the, the world order yes. uh, is leading to more nationalism. I think also, obviously, the, the threats of terrorism are, are uh, creating more of a need uh, to spend on defense. And we think aerospace and defense at Strategus is a growth industry for the next several years. All right, so we have a phone company and we have a, some defense stock. Jason Trenner, it's so great to have you here thank on WellTrack once again. And Philippe Brecher Trelot, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point, if you have the stomach for it, think like a contrarian and buy a small amount of European stocks. One of my favorite financial journalists, Jason Zweig, the intelligent investor columnist at the Wall Street Journal, recently headlined his column, The More It Hurts, The More You Usually Make. We will have a link to it on our website, wealthtrack.com. 
He pointed out that the Vanguard FTSE Europe ETF, which tracks a broad index of European stocks, toppled 11.3% on the Friday after the Brexit vote, its worst one-day return ever. Also, European stocks have had a terrible money-losing decade when U.S. stocks were making money. Reversion to the mean, anyone? Zweig recommends the worse the news out of Europe gets, the more you should buy. Think like a contrarian. Well, next week, we're going to discuss investing in a turbulent world with one of the wisest men on Wall Street, economist and strategist Nick Sargent, and former star mutual fund manager, now a great private investor, Bill Wilby. To see a web-exclusive interview with our guests, click on the extra feature on our website, wealthtrack.com. Also, continue to reach out to us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management Global Perspective, Rosalind P. Walter, and the Fairholme Foundation.